right, so I am delighted to speak with all of you today, and I really hope that I never have to uh, engage the gentleman that just spoke before me. That is sort of my goal in life at Glimpse, is to stay away from the litigators. Uh, no offense to those of you who do that for a profession, uh, but my, I'm a lover, not a fighter, and I'm really uh, delighted to have this position at Glimpse where we really do get a chance to influence the, the way in which our products are designed and the way in which uh, consumers uh, interoperate with us. So, um, and I also wanted to follow up on a comment that a previous speaker uh, made about the chief privacy officer, and he was wondering really what that position was about, and I can tell you now, uh, it's so that somebody can go to jail in Germany. So, that under German law, one person needs to be designated the privacy officer, and it is a personal and um, criminal offense for you to break any of their data privacy laws, so I could be extradited. So anyway, I've got that going for me. Uh, I don't think that um, I'm being paid enough, just FYI. Anyway, let's get going with this. Uh, so today, my, my topic heading is, is super cookies. And I use that really because super cookies, at least to me, are a lovely way of talking about some of the larger policy implications and business issues and practical considerations around what I would call uh, the Internet of Things. And I would say super cookies are, have been around for a very long time, actually. And we like to think that this is a new phenomenon. And actually, what we're seeing in the Internet of Things is really a morphing of what has traditionally been called a super cookie into a way for devices to communicate with each other. So part of my goal here is to scare you a little bit about Big Brother and your connected home, uh, but also to give you some reassurance that it's not gone all haywire and amok. So super cookies, is, are, are you all familiar with the concept of a super cookie, um, generally? Generally, there was a lot of uh, publicity about super, super cookies uh, probably about six months ago when Verizon was accused of leaving persistent identifiers on phones uh, that could track individual behavior even when you had your privacy mode on. And this was based on the idea that well, you know, somebody could change their mind and want to know what they did in the past uh, and re, uh, repopulate the data that had previously been connected. Obviously, this didn't go down very well with a lot of regulators and with a lot of privacy advocates. So that has been changed so that it's, it's a rather, um, it's possible but rather challenging to uh, delete that identifier, which is a persistent identifier within the app. So, the Internet of Things really has a, a, a similar concept to it. So with the Internet of Things with the new Internet Protocol 6, uh, there will be the ability to do something very similar to what we see in super cookies, meaning the ability to enable persistent identifiers between devices. So it's, you know, we just got done with the Christmas holiday season. Did anybody get one of these presents? A little Apple Watch? Nobody? I'm the coolest person in the room. That makes me feel so good. So it makes me feel like Dick Tracy, actually, because um, I can talk into my watch and, and get a hold of my son. And in fact, I can, I love it. I just scroll down, it says Groupon, irresistible Groupon deals near you. So that makes you feel kind of good. <laughs> um, you know, I have this theory that if Darwin is right, we're all going to turn into uh, a species with giant eyes and tiny fingers. So anyway, so, so cook, super cookies and uh, the Internet of Things really are designed to do a couple of things for you. They're designed to uh, collect personal information, your habits, location, physical information, and um, you know, it's, it's, we think about smart TVs and smart televisions and smart refrigerators, and we forget that those are not unlike this watch. They are part of this ecosystem that's being developed that is slowly, um, probably the fastest growing industry right now in the technology sector. Uh, I think in, in 2016, they estimate that there's going to be 1.6 billion internet connected things, not just 
But think about that for a minute. I mean, this will become as ubiquitous as, um, as a PC. So who has a smart TV, for example? All right, so we've got a few purists out there, and I, uh, but the majority of folks here have smart TVs, and voice activated, anyone? Okay, so a voice activated TV or a voice activated remote, for example, um, all of that information gets collected and aggregated and stored. So if you look at all that tiny paperwork that comes with your television, just as an example, uh, there is a, a warning, for instance, LG, got some pretty bad press around this, but at least they disclosed it, which basically said, hey, careful, don't say out loud personal information because that will be information that we collect and use to um, help you control your device here. So the Internet of Things is, is sort of an interesting phenomenon because we want it. We want to have things that are kind of cool and connect us up and, and make our lives easier. So for example, we're on vacation and all of a sudden uh, we get a notification that our hot water heater burst. This actually happened to me. I did not have a sensor. <laughs> and we get an alert through our text me message alert. And then we can remotely enable a plumber to come in. And we can remotely enable a neighbor to come by. Or we can remotely enable the um, insurance agent to come and investigate this all while you're on vacation and before any serious damage occurs. So these things aren't per se bad, uh, and we want that kind of functionality, but it's a really difficult business model when you start looking into how the ecosystem works together and how as consumers and as providers of those services, we can create a, an ecosystem that's trustworthy and, and balances that fine relationship between uh, a customer's expectations and need for privacy versus the need for a seamless experience. And I don't know, how many of you uh, advise technology companies on a regular basis, but I know Tyson, you can certainly speak, speak to this. The, the, the thing I get all the time is, this is gonna wreck our UI. This is gonna wreck our U UX, you know? Customer experience, customer experience. Ah, I hate you lawyers. Don't make us put a EULA there. So don't do a click to accept or, or any sort of notification. We don't wanna scare people off. So it, there is this fine line and a healthy tension almost between uh, legal, and I see people nodding and smiling right now, uh, and also the need to um, recognize that, yeah, we don't want to bog down an experience with a bunch of clicks and acceptances, and by the way, I can't read that. I mean, I can barely <laughs> read the numbers uh, to figure out what time it is. So what do you do when you've got limited, if any, uh, opportunities to communicate with the consumer from the device itself. So here's some examples of uh, what I would call the Internet of Things. Let's see if I can play this. Maybe. Maybe not. Thank <laughs> you. 
sharing device that respects privacy of the individual user, and instead I'm using the Apple feature, you know, who, who's to say that this is an, a, a, an easy way to hack into where I am and where I'm running and where I, how late I'm working and how late I work generally and where my car is parked. So all of these things raise legitimate privacy concerns that have not yet been fully fleshed out and probably won't be until we see some major disaster happen God forbid, or somebody does track me and follow me to my car. <coughs> and then there's the, the, the more practical risk, I think, which is probably the most, um, the most plausible being, hey, with all this information, how is it going to be used? How is it going to be used in the context of buying insurance? So will they be able to go back into my data and figure out Hillary never locks her door? Uh, that's not true. I lock it all the time. Um, or Hillary doesn't... Uh, uh, generally conserve energy and so we need to put a tax on her for her uh, on her Puget Sound energy bill um, and you know my credit rating could be impacted by whether or not I, they, I am doing things that feel responsible and we're already seeing that in uh, some insurance companies who are using trackers on cars to see whether or not you are obeying the speed limit and uh, does anybody have that by any chance I mean I really don't know a lawyer that would take that on, but anyway, <laughs> um, I all of those things, even smart cameras, you know, so cameras designed for security purposes uh, are potentially hackable and uh, could be turned almost against you potentially to record your own movements and, and behaviors. And you know, we see that. You know, the, the horror stories, I don't know if you remember uh, some of the old hacking stories. This, this dates me, I think, but I remember uh, some of the original hackers to a system that was not yet completely secure. This was before um, they had a lot of security measures in place on, on the internet. But in sort of a vine for uh, the title of Prince of Darkness, I suppose, of some sort, uh, there were some, some Russian and American uh, hackers competing online to see who could hack fastest and who could get the most information from the other. And one of the hackers um, started just rattling off online, okay, here's your mother's name, here's your mother's maiden name, here's your this, here's your that. And the other side was not 
responding at all. So the hacker who thought he was just, you know, winning this Prince of Darkness title um, stopped when his power went out. So what are we doing from a policy perspective? I mean, so let's go back to some of the basics that we've gotten from the FTC. Uh, last year, the FTC came out with its Internet of Things best practices uh, report. Uh, it's, it's a lovely read. It was a three-year process of roundtables, and I think all the technology that they talked about at that point in time is now completely obsolete. Um, but uh, at least some of the basic principles still remain. And for anybody who has worked in the space, privacy, <coughs> anything that's regulating data and uh, personal information, these aren't new concepts. So it's got to be secure, you've got to give people choice. Um, I love it. Access accuracy it does have a typo in it, so that's memorable. Uh, data minimization, security, accountability. Those are the, the main things that the FTC is looking for when it is um, looking for reasonable uh, practices with the Internet of Things. Now, how do you actually translate that to real life, and how do we bring that to our clients and into our workplace? Um, let's start with security, all right? So, what do you do? How, how, how do you conduct a risk assessment of the Internet of Things? And how do you create a data protection program that makes sense given what you do? And I think one of the interesting things about the FTC's report is that it, it sort of glosses over the idea that a lot of folks who are developing these products are companies like mine. Now, we're startups. We are VC-backed, and we're just trying to get something to work. And the idea of having a massive structure in place to ensure that nothing ever goes wrong, especially in an ecosystem where there are a lot of other players, is really difficult. And it's difficult to implement in a way that's cost effective. And, it, we, and for those of us also who don't have our own data centers and who don't control immediate access to that data, we need to look to third-party service providers and make sure that those service providers are also living up to some of these bars. So, and those service providers can be anything from hardware manufacturers to AWS. And so the, the challenge, I think, especially for those of us who are trying to uh, participate in this emerging market, is to find good partnerships, good relationships, and balance the need to create a functional product at a reasonable cost with the idea that, hey, we also need to, to be good stewards of uh, privacy and information. So the other, uh, the other so I picked these, these elements of the FTC's report because I think they're the most uh, applicable to the Internet of Things and the world that I live in. Uh, but certainly, of course, there are other issues that relate more to the hosting centers and, and uh, pure data providers. Um, but the, the idea of data minimization, and so this has been an issue, I think, since data was ever collected from any sort of device, whether it's, it's a thing of the internet or it's a, a device that you're using um, for work or, for, or on your phone. So the issue here is, does the application that you're using, does the data collected reasonably relate to the functionality of the thing? And I think we all remember the Target case. Do, do folks know what I'm talking about, Target? Yeah, so for those of you who don't know, uh, Target decided to do a very robust campaign to uh, encourage meaningful ads with end users. And they tracked behavior of consumers within it. the grocery store, figured out that there was a correlation between people who were expecting babies, women who were, were pregnant, and the purchase of certain things, like unscented lotion and the, what have you. Well, all of a sudden, all these coupons start coming to this one woman's home. Problem is, she's 16, and her father doesn't know she's pregnant. And those coupons are all for new baby things. So that's an example of something that goes beyond the expectation, the reasonable expectation of the consumer. On the other hand, uh, if I am sharing my location, for example, I expect that the latitude and longitude of where I am is going to be broadcast to the person that I select. And that you won't be looking for, okay, 
is Hillary also at a retail location that she could use some Groupon coupons for? So the, the data minimization concept is really about how do you how do you marry up and make reasonable that, that which is collected, and then how long do you keep it, and how long do you store it? Because the longer you store anything, the further uh, you chances you have for some sort of breach, or and, and the more enticing your data becomes to third parties. So one of the things that that I I'm going to try not to make a shameless plug for Glimpse, really. I'm trying to use this as a case study. But uh, one of the reasons I even I went to that company was because we have a 24-hour turnaround time with our data. And that's really unheard of. And the data that we do collect doesn't marry up to your device. So you can actually use the, the application through the web service. You don't have to download the app itself. And uh, the information gets completely obfuscated. So you go back to uh, try to get somebody's location or even your own location later in time, and you can't because it's all gone. We, in fact, was, the only complaints I've had so far as a chief privacy officer has been from a, a, a young college student who used Glimpse to track his entire summer program uh, and travels throughout Europe and was quite angry when he found out he could not get his map back. This is not a plant. I did not. <laughs> this was not. I, there's no cash payment for you. Um, so I think, as Tyson was, was saying earlier, uh, a glimpse is a. It's a mobile app that runs on a variety of different platforms, and it enables me to select somebody. Let's say Carl, um, and I want Carl to know where I am, and I. But I only want him to know for a limited period of time, and once. Once I get to my destination, uh, I want my information to be gone. So I open up my app, or I can do this on the web, either way, and it, I have hit a button called Share My Location. Then I, uh, it generates a text message. The text message, if you've got an iOS, it, doesn't have, it does something some, somewhat different in Android, but for the iOS experience, I send an invitation to Carl. Carl gets my invitation, and he has the opportunity to either accept it or, or reject it. Once he accepts it, he a map pops up, and there's me. La, 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 la. It's looking, so it's almost like the UI of an Uber, um, but it only lasts for the time that I set. So if I want to be 15 minutes, after 15 minutes, he can't see me anymore. Uh, and he can't go back to find me uh, later in time. But it's only location services. Correct. So it's all location-based services. And uh, it's, it's, the interesting part is, is actually taking it into the enterprise space. So going from a consumer-based application that's distributed for free to, hey, OK, I want to order pizza, and, or I want to know when my cable guy's coming. Uh, and the ability to track that and find where that person or, or delivery provider is in real time and knowing that that person or that driver will not be able to find me again. And so it has a, a layer of security and safety around it. That's all I'll say about Glimpse, unless others would like to have it for me. Go ahead. I'm not a plant. Oh, God. I'm not a plant, <laughs> and it's a great app. It is a great app. Thank you so much. Um, I developed it. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Those of us who can't do, just criticize and advise. So. Um, the other part, again, the, the, the third part of this uh, challenge with the Internet of Things, and one of the reasons why this is becoming such a big issue for companies like mine, is that we're starting to get involved in cars, for example. So all the next generation of cars that are coming out, uh, we've got a, a static button inside of it. So you can pre-program, hey, I want my wife or my husband to know when I'm leaving work, and um, I don't want to have to send a text. I don't want to go through that process. I just hit this button on my dashboard, and I don't have to text while I'm driving. I don't have to call while I'm driving. And originally, that was the whole uh, point of, of the application, was let's get people to not text and drive. And it evolved from there. So notice and choice. So how do you provide notice and choice in a car? I mean, that's part of the challenge that we face, because 
in some ways, I'm, I want people to know what we're doing. I want them to feel comfortable with how our app works. My developers do not want you know, a, a giant booklet to come with every car, and they don't want anything more than a paragraph in the owner's manual. So these are the constraints in which we have to work. And, uh, and the notice and choice component really is still a slippery sort of slope and scale because you also run into problems like, okay, well, who, who's really responsible for that notice? And, and how do we enable opting out when we don't have a direct relationship with the consumer? So in, in the example of a car, you know, it's natively enabled within the car, but you can take it down if, if you don't want to have it natively enabled in your car. Whose job is it? And then how do, how do the privacy policies get communicated in a way that's meaningful? And I, I, I've dealt with enough EULAs in my lifetime to tell you that if I never see another click to accept, I'm, I'd be so happy. But it seems that that's really the only way in which we can get some of this information across, even though nobody reads them. Has anybody ever really read a EULA that wasn't paid to do it? We got one. Yay! <laughs> Not many of them. <laughs> yeah, I, and I, um, well, I shouldn't tell the story, but, but... But a lot of times I browse through it just to see what it says about privacy. Right, or you're looking for, so we pull out our privacy policy from the terms and conditions just so it's static and people can look at it. Still, I get emails, I get probably five or six emails a day saying, you know, I, I want to share my location. I'm not sure how to do it. Like, it almost becomes like a how-to as opposed to a um, what should I be worried about from a privacy perspective. So these are the practical considerations, and we've started talking about them already, but you know, who is the provider? You know, in, this, in the situation of the video that we saw, is it Nike? Or is it the provider of the chip? Or is it the provider of the hosted application that enables all kinds of weird things to happen to a person who's running for reasons that are unsavory? Um, and, and what is the product itself? What is being sold? Is it hardware? Is it software? Is it an online service? One of the issues that we're really dealing with is the education of different entities who are used to, I mean, so we went from licensing shiny disks to licensing enterprise software, to licensing software as a service, now we're licensing instances uh, of, of sensing and, and communication, but they don't require the same kind of uptime commitments and things like that that we struggled with in the traditional SaaS model. And you know, who has the data and who owns it and where is it stored? Uh, is that something that is outsourced? Is that something that's insourced? I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've had to uh, reassure uh, some of our customers and potential customers, trust us, you do not want us to host our own data. <laughs> there are people out there who do this far better than a startup uh, that is on Capitol Hill and occupying a warehouse space. You want AWS, you want Azure, you want the, the proven data providers and trackers uh, and folks that will um, be able to stand behind their policies and procedures and, and they know what to do. This isn't our, our wheelhouse. Our wheelhouse is location-based technologies. We're not a data center. So all of those things are, are I think, becoming more of a uh, hot button issue. Uh, for practical deal terms. And the, the reality and the deal itself are not yet meshed up. So, and, and also there is the data itself. You know, I, in the, the model in which Glimpse works, for example, we are a, an API call. There is a window within somebody else's UI that uh, calls that map and calls that location information. And it is time, so we, we marry up latitude, longitude, latitude, longitude, timers, and put it on a map and display where everybody goes. But we don't touch, uh, like for example, in an enterprise situation, we don't touch the consumer information. Whether or not somebody sends a glimpse as a driver is generated by somebody else, and it's gen generated by the customer's database. So for example, um, I want to build Bob's Pizza. I have an online account. I order online. 
I have a relationship with Bill Bob's Pizza, and then, it, then I get a delivery driver who sends me a glimpse. Do you want to see where your delivery is? Well, yes, I do. Okay, and that's the experience I have, but really, glimpses only interaction is within that framed window. We don't know who that person is, we don't know who the driver is, we don't have anybody's phone numbers. Yeah, you know, is that person identifiable information? Well, location is potentially, but it's not married up with anything that could identify the individual, and it's not kept for long enough to uh, at least give me heartburn. The issue then becomes in deals, but we want that data. <laughs> We're Bill Bob's Pizza. We want to see who is the better driver and who gets the deliveries in no time and how many cheese pizzas are ordered in a week. And it's been a, an interesting policy choice for us not to go down that path because that creates, in my mind at least, a different business proposition and that's not what we do. So, so the, the practical considerations, again, just like who, who, where, what, when, you know, who is the provider? Who has the relationship with the end user consumer? What is the product? Where is the data? When is the data relevant? And again, why is the information being retrieved? And again, that's that nexus between consumer expectation of what that data is gonna do and um, what's reasonable to expect from a consumer. Again, I use a Nike Fitbit, for example. I'm not expecting to have my life analyzed. So those are the types of, of disconnects that get companies in trouble and, and and outside of their, their wheelhouse. So, and I guess the, the real issue for, for in-house counsel, for industry, uh, for those advising clients is how, how do we best serve the consumer? Because at the end of the day, our customers, our consumers, the end user, if they're not satisfied, we fail. And if they can't trust our ecosystem, we fail. And so, what is the real expectation from, from consumers? And how do, how do we gauge that, and how do we respond to that responsibly? And you know, it, that raises other interesting issues, at least for me, around generational divides. My son has no problem sharing everything more than I'd like him to on Instagram and Facebook, and you know, I, Fortunately, I'm a required uh, friend on Facebook. Otherwise, I think it would be here. Here's my social security number and address. Please come see me now. Huh? Anybody want to share? Here's my credit card. Anybody? Anybody want to order something on Amazon together? Um, he, he wouldn't go that far, but still, uh, the, the, the younger people seem to be, the more comfortable they seem to be with technology, and the more comfortable they get, uh, the less paranoid they are, and the more sharing occurs. And uh, so I call it the slow adoption of, of healthy paranoia because it's only when that credit card does get breached or there is something that's transmitted without their uh, authority or even some of those, those uh, instances we've seen, for example, down in Corvallis with the Instagram situation in schools. And um, I expect that there will be a, a few more of those things before that, that quasi-millennial generation uh, starts to get a little bit more nervous about how they're using technology. And certainly, when it comes to the Internet of Things, the, the lack of potential sophistication there is something that we also have to keep in mind when we're thinking about consumer expectations. And so that, this brings up some interesting public policy issues, and I thought I would share um, these uh, really inspiring words from our legislature. Mr. President, uh, there is a disturbing report in the uh, Washington Post today about uh, a major telephone company, uh, Verizon, uh, putting super cookies on the phones that its customers are being used, which will allow uh, those customers to be tracked. And if that information is turned over to uh, other uh, third parties to be utilized for purposes of advertising, uh, even though the customer has indicated that they do not want uh, that particular cookie placed on their device, uh, our staff on the Commerce Committee will be investigating this and uh, we certainly uh, want to make sure 
that in this time of the ubiquity of eyes prying all around in this electronic age that we are living, that we preserve the rights of privacy for all individuals. Uh, this is a matter of particular importance to the Commerce Committee. It is of uh, extreme importance to this senator, and uh, I will keep the Senate informed. Mr. President, I yield the floor. All right. So the thing I want to point out here is um, down on the lower right-hand corner, it's got 413 views. I am, I comprise two of those. Again, ubiquity of I is prying all around, but not on this particular speech. Instead, this right here is the most popular video on YouTube. Yeah, that's right. It's 42 million viewers versus 400. And if that gives us any sort of indication of the public's desire to get involved in these issues or their own priorities, we have to consider whether or not uh, this is a huge red flag issue for us or whether or not we need to actually start taking care of the public in ways that they don't even realize they need to be taken care of. So again, you know, super cookies, <coughs> unique IDs, they can delete cannot delete, everybody got nervous. In fact, the senators wrote a very lovely uh, letter to the FTC about six years after Super Cookies came out. And so Verizon cleaned up its act, but that doesn't change the basic premise that there are static identifiers necessarily embedded in the things of the internet. So, um, one of the interesting things that I found was that most folks who buy smart home devices, including security cameras, don't ever change the password either. So again, this issue of public policy and whether or not we need to protect consumers from themselves, I think is, is it goes down to even the most basic level. And I don't know if you saw this Jimmy Kimmel uh, presentation, but I think it's just spot on. Oh, <laughs> 
I've made my point uh, on the consumer expectation component of the FTC, uh, words of wisdom, and I think the other the other piece of this, so again, I'm using cookie as sort of the overall word for all of the data that gets generated, collected, used within devices with um, permanent identifiers. And the, the, the thing that really came out of this little chart is the NSA. I mean, so if we're talking again about public policy, we also have to look at the flip side of that, which is how much and how, how comfortable are we in sharing this information. Shortly after the Paris bombings, there was quite a bit of news around, uh, oh my gosh, they were using location sharing uh, within this perimeter, it was very private, and we need private industry to start tracking these people. <laughs> okay, as a, as a GC for a location-based technology, I, I'm blown away by that statement because, okay, uh, on the one hand, we need to give notice, opt out, reasonable consumer expectations, we've got kind of privacy, security, uh, notice and choice, and all of these things. Um, I'm being told my time is up, so I'll be very, I'll be very quick on this. But uh, all of these things are in direct conflict then with for example, the NSA's rights to get that information from us. So the real answer to me, frankly, is privacy by design. I mean, that's really the, the heart of the issue for me and, and at least for the company that I work with. We look at the design features to solve a lot of the consumer expectation issues, the consumer <coughs> fallibility issues, and also to create an experience that's trustworthy and that we can bank on going forward. So, for example, the, the collection of information doesn't involve your name. It involves information that you generate. You have an option to accept it or reject it. You have the option to use the app or to use it online. We keep the information for about 24 hours, even though some of our customers want us to keep it longer. So creating internal systems and processes for ensuring that these big bad things don't happen, to me, is the only real practical way of being able to uh, cover all of these various issues, all of which are legitimate, and all of which are challenging for business. So, uh, so the, there is a break coming up next, so you are all free to get up and leave. This is just a fun video about uh, the future of privacy as we know it. And this is done by the Onion News Network, and I love it that it was done in 2007. I think it was quite prescient. So thank you very much.